But I'm chairperson of Westminster North Conservatives. And I'm absolutely thrilled that we're doing a live um, uh, Q&A uh, with Sean Bailey, the Conservative candidate uh, for London Mayor. Uh, and uh, we'll say hi. Hi, Sean. Hi, how are you? Evening to everybody. It's nice to see you all. Um, thank you. Look, it's great. It's, uh, thank you so much for doing this. I think it's, it's great. Pleasure. My pleasure. Um, and I think uh, I'm going to put you big so everyone can see you. And uh, um, I think you need to explain. Let's learn about the room. Where are you? What are you? You look like you're in a in the broom cupboard. Effectively, I am. Um, we have a, 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 a modest three-bedroom house, and this is the only place where the children don't rule the roost. It's a little cupboard. I, I normally keep my sort of tech gear in here. I, I build gliders and I race radio control cars and those kind of things, and I like to build computers and the like. And this is the little cupboard I do that in. In lockdown times, it's now become my office. I, I lock the door. I try to get as much work done as possible. Anybody who's a parent listening to this will know that one of the tough aspects of um, lockdown has been homeschooling. It's been tough to work and do homeschooling. I've been very busy at work, unbelievably so. So this is my sanctum sanctorium where I hide. Fantastic. And um, uh, so, look, if this is your broom cupboard, what's your what's your companion? I've been I've been looking up the. The, the the CCTV uh, uh, CCTV uh, the BBC Charles BBC it says Gordon the Gopher Ed the Duck Otis the Aardvark uh, Imlin the Gremlin which one would yours be if you if you're in your lockdown cupboard um, let me see I'm a big fan of I'm a big fan of Howard the Duck Howard it's Ed, you... Ed, Ed the Ed the Duck Oh, Ed the Duck. Well, well mine would be how I suppose. But Ed, uh, 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 one of my sort of childhood pursuits was to collect comics, and Howard the Duck was in there. Oh, was okay. well, well, I used to, used to work in the comic shop on Portobello Road called Fantastic Store. Oh, I worked wow. there for years. I worked there for years. Well, uh, so, what do you, do you still have comics? Have you kept? Have you kept I them? I have a great, enormous pile of them. Probably wow. In excess, in excess of ten thousand, I'd say. Wow. Well, and so what's the, the one you're most proud of? Um, I mean, there's lots of them. There's one called Displaced Paranormals, which is just, you have to be a real geek to know about that. Um, and there's a good few graphic novels. My favourite graphic novel, for, for instance, is probably The Dark Knight Returns. I'm a big fan of that. Wow. And um, what's the map on the, on the side with the, with the pins in? So this is my map of Britain. Um, I think one of my things is, is to enjoy the country that you're in. I, I'm, I'm proud of my British roots. I, I want to see what the country looks like. So I've slowly been marking out on the map some of the places that I've been in the country. I have a great big gap here in the Pennines. So that's my next sort of area of, of, of attention. I'll, I'll try to arrange some trips there. For the last sort of five or six years, as a family, we've been, we've been holidaying in, in the country. We haven't been flying everywhere. We've left the country once and even then we drove. We've been driving around the country to have our holidays rather than go elsewhere. So um, this is my map to show where we've been. Some of that is work as well. No, brilliant. No, brilliant. It's very interesting. So now how is locked? How's lockdown with the family? How's that going? You said you're doing you're doing homeschooling. Do you have a particular area of expertise? Is it geography? The, like the... Um, lockdown for me has been broken down into three areas, really. Family, work, and community. So on the community end, I've been doing lots of work with my, my local people, my local church, I'm a member. We were handing out these leaflets saying, email us, contact us, ring us, and we'll see if we can support you through lockdown. That's been steadily growing. As time goes on and people need more and more support, our activity has been growing there. So we've been doing deliveries and the like, and just speaking to people over Zoom and the phone. Um, the other piece I've been doing, I've been speaking to NHS frontline workers, people running small businesses, anybody sort of running youth or charity stuff, anybody trying to support their broader community around dealing with this COVID outbreak. I've been doing a lot of Zoom meetings with them. An example would be I spoke to a bike shop, for instance, that's been giving free repairs. So it's been taking in break, broken bikes, repairing them and giving them to NHS workers so they can ride to work to socially distance. Wow. I saw a group of students who've come up with a, a logistic app to help people volunteer properly and, and move around all the assets that we have in any given place. They're now trying to roll that out internationally. That's one end. On the other end, my day job, I'm still a, a member of the London Assembly. 
although this isn't a time for sort of, you know, punch and duty politics, it is still my job to hold the mayor to account. So I've been pressing him to do the things I think will be good for London. For instance, I asked for him to temporarily suspend the congestion charge in the US so um, hospital workers in particular could drive in and socially isolate. I've been asking him to get PPE for um, TFL staff because, to my mind, they are at the front line. So I think they need protecting more than most. So we do things like that. And of course, I'm beginning to have conversations with my own team about what London looks like after COVID. How do we support community? How do we rebuild businesses? Because of course, we run a real risk of losing a lot of employment here. And anybody who works for a living knows, you know, a week without your job, you're done. A month, six months, wow. So I'm really working hard now to understand how we can support that end of our, our goings on. And the last thing I'd say is family. I, I, um, it's been great for me. I've had a crazy two years. So being at home in one sense and spending this much time with my wife and my children has been great, but it's been tough. I made a joke about homeschooling, but that is hard. <laughs> but I, I've turned out to be quite the art teacher. I, I, I've enjoyed <laughs> doing a lot of art. So it's been great finding that sense. I find that. Well, yes, but I, like, I didn't know you had that, the, the love of um, graphic novels. So like, yeah, I can imagine you do know a lot about, about art and design. Um, you, you talked about um, the PPE, and I think I know you've been focused on that, and, and rightly so. And uh, you tweeted out um, against uh, um, City Cars found funding for concert venues, and your tweet was, what would you choose, 2.3 million for concert venues or 2.1 million for PPE, masks and gloves, to protect 60,000 TFL workers for 30 days? Do you want to, you want to tell us, everyone, a bit about that? I think the thing is, for a very long time now, the mayor is, he's a very political mayor, we, we, we know that. Any opportunity to go after government, he, he does that. Fair enough, it's politics, I get it. But right here, right now, no. This is about defending the lives of Londoners. This is literally life and death. So instead of taking our collective funds and, you know, making a few people happy, he should be keeping everybody safe. That 2.3 million could have bought an absolute mountain a mountain of PPE to keep people who were you've, you've sourced safe. some, is that right? You've, you've identified. I, I, what I'm trying to do in this period is not is not just be political. I'm trying to be useful. And in order to demonstrate to the mayor, I wasn't just trying to um, poke him. I went out and sourced over 600,000 um, K95 um, masks, KN95 masks, just to show him that the supplies there can be done. He is a chairman of TFL. He is responsible for the safety of those staff. He has the money and he has the right to provide that. He doesn't need permission. He should go right ahead and do it. And I'll keep pressuring him to do it as well. Because as you all know, we've, I think we've already lost 36 members of TFL staff. That's not right. It's, it's just, he needs to keep these people safe. And on top of that, it's not just me. The unions are asking for it as well. I know the GMB did. They're asking for PPE. Come on, City can't give the people the PPE. And if you, is there anything, what else would you do differently if you were chairperson of, of TFL right now? I think the major thing I'd do, again, and I asked the mayor about this very, very early on, I would not have cut the level of transport. We have very good data about how many people use the transport system in any given day. Even with massive cuts in, 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 in the amount of people traveling on the transport, we would have known it would, it would be congested. I use a tube every morning. It is absolutely packed. Packed. It is just packed. So the fact that a lot of people weren't using the tube doesn't mean we didn't still need full capacity. And I think that was a real, it was a real misstep by the mayor. I think he he started to, in, in his defence, he has actually started to turn around and provide m m many more services. But initially, I wouldn't have cut that. And I, and I told him as much in the beginning. You need to keep people who have to work as safe as possible. Now, we obviously had hope that you were would have been mayor by, by now um, and being able to, to make these decisions. Um, but obviously the, the election was cancelled. It's been extended for a year. Um, how, do you, how do you and your family feel about that? I mean, for me, it was, um, it, it's twofold, isn't it? Like I said, I've had a crazy two years, London Assembly, you know, working to become the mayor. And so for my family, it's been pretty tough. But my wife is right behind me. She said, look, in for a penny, in for a pound, go for it, keep going. I, so away we went. 
Um, from a sort of public point of view, democracy is very important, but we can't have any impediments to, to democracy. People have to be able to vote. And if voting was going to potentially lose you your life, of course, that's ridiculous. And I often face the question, you know, can you really win? Can you beat Sadiq Khan? Well, actually, I can. And an extra year really increases that possibility no end. Because in my opinion, um, he hasn't been a good mayor. Ken was significantly better, and so was Boris. And I'm not running for cool. mayor for my own ego. I'm doing it because I think London can and should do better. And that needs someone with, to lead London in that direction. And I just don't see that leadership from Sadiq Khan. But like I say, an extra year increases the chances of beating him. And, you know, I'm, I'm up, I'm ready and rearing to go, and I'll just march on until that date comes. No, fan fantastic. You know, and we've had a couple of questions sent in, so thank you, um, Philip and Julian. Uh, anyone who's got questions, uh, put them in the comments, uh, and, uh, and we're going to try to get get to them. We're going to try and get to as many as as many as possible. Uh, and uh, you know, with that in mind, uh, we'll go we'll go straight to uh, uh, to one of them. So Julian has asked, um, "Hi, Sean. What lessons have you learned through this extended period of of campaigning?" Um, because um, you obviously you were ready to go, right? You were ready to. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd already been. I was already selected very early. I'd say the lessons I learned are twofold. One, I've learned more and more about modern campaigning, and my thing is, my politics comes from a place of I'm trying to work for people who have to work for a living. You know, who who who, 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 who sometimes we don't always make it to the end of the month financially. That's sort of where my 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 politics come from. I myself have been homeless. You know, I had massive student loans. I know what it's like to struggle in London. I want to make London better for that vast number of people. What I've learned is um, there's a lot of people out there who agree with me. And I've learned how you contact people and speak to them about what is relevant to them. I think sometimes in politics, you can get very caught up in the game and what's going on in City Hall or in Westminster. I always want to be focused on what people are what's going on in people's homes, how are they coping, that's, that's important for me. Um, I think on a personal level, I've learned to just keep going and just, just appreciate people who are out to help me and not be handicapped by, about, by people who are against me. Because there's been ups and downs, believe there have been ups and downs. But um, you know, you, ju you just soldier on, don't you? And also, I've learned it's a great privilege to be in this position, to have people support you it has been major. I, I was on a bus a little while ago and I, I met a, a, Rasta, a Rasta man and he said to me, his struggle, he said he, he said he's going to be tough for him to vote Conservative, but he'll consider doing it for me. But he said, for me, I should go for it because his struggle politically as a young man was so that black men, poor men, could be in any political party, could do anything they liked. And he really liked the fact that I was stepping out and put my head above the parapet. And that was really encouraging to me. It was really, really encouraging to me. And it's that kind of conversation that lets you know you're in a privileged position and you should savor that and remember it. That's, no, and so you mentioned you were um, homeless in, in that. Could you, do you want to tell us a bit more about that? Some... So in my early 20s, um, you know, we lived in council accommodation. They housed my mum. They didn't house me. Um, it, it was tough. I spent a long, many, many years sofa surfing, about eight or nine, actually, sofa surfing at a few points where I got very close to rough sleeping. But fortunately for me, I'm a West Londoner, born and bred, and I was in West London. So I had a lot of contact who, who would keep me for a month or week. I mean, I went to my aunt's house when I left university and said to her, hey, now I'll be here for probably three weeks. I was there about 18 months. <laughs> and Aunt Wilma, she absolutely, without her, my friend Alex, who put me up through most of the university, my friend Scott as well, and Aunt Norma, I have no idea what I'd have done. And every time I got close to, to almost sleeping rough, the pressure and the fear that that situation generates, words fail me. But that's why I say this position I'm in is a pleasure, it is a privilege, sorry. Because what I was able to do just before the budget was go to the Chancellor and say, look, Rough sleeping, sofa surfing, homelessness is a real scourge in London. Can we have some extra money for that? And he found the money. To, to his credit, he found the money. But I, I, I wanted to make that representation, and I, I was able to speak to him from a place of experience, and I think he appreciated that. 
Uh, it's an it's an well, it's, it's quite an experience you've been through, and it's an important reference reference point. And and, um, and actually, uh, um, uh, Philip has sent in a, a question uh, about housing and, and obviously the accessibility of housing for people in London. Uh, his question is, hi, Sean, do you think it's even possible for the mayor to solve London's housing crisis, uh, given its severity and the mayor's limited powers in relation to housing? So there's two things I'd say. An earlier question, you asked me, what have I learned? What I've learned is massive things are possible in London. And let's be clear, the mayor does have the power and he does have the money and it is his responsibility. There is no planning authority in this country except the minister who has more power than the mayor and boy, does the mayor have some money. He has 4.82 billion pounds for public housing. London has half of all money for public housing in the country. So the idea that the mayor doesn't have the money, doesn't have the power, I, I simply don't agree with it. It's there. If I didn't agree with that, I'd be lobbying the government, not trying to become mayor. That's the first thing. Secondly, in London, the mayor is the planning authority. He can make decisions to make things happen. One of the most exciting policy briefs I believe I have that my team and I are working on, we have a strong retail offer around housing. And my own personal experience has shown me something. I will start by building social housing, copious amounts of social housing, but it won't be the only thing I do. I think one of the mistakes that um, Sadiq Khan has made is only talking about social housing. If you're watching this now and you have a housing need, ask yourself, are you even eligible for social housing? Many, many, many of the people in London with housing problem wouldn't get social housing, and I need to house them as well. So I will be building from social housing to, to the middle, as it were. People are at the top and can afford full market. Good luck to you. Get on with it. The rest of us, that's who I'm going to cater for, and I'm going to go slightly beyond social housing because I want young professionals, um, single men, you know, families, slightly older people who, who maybe your relationships changed or you just didn't have anywhere solid and you're now looking when you're on your own, I want those people to be housed as well. And that's why I'm going to build a broad range of housing. We have the land in London. We just need to change the policy around so we can deliver on, on, on what we need in London. Um, and we've had a follow on question uh, in, uh, in the comments from Julian. Uh, if I can ask a second second question, Julian, Julian, you can. <laughs> um, okay, um, but, and that's to everyone, so like, if you've got questions, put them in the comments. Uh, I know Sean's keen to answer as many as he can. Um, uh, if I can ask a second, what are, you, what are your views on rent controls and Airbnb slash short letting uh, in London? I'll separate these two things out. I think first and foremost, rent controls, no, no, and no again. Rent controls hasn't worked anywhere in the world. So that would be my response to that. What rent controls does is normally it just reduces supply and quality. And in a market of Lon like, like London with such high land values, it would be calamitous. I believe Sadiq Khan knows this and he's made rent controls the center of his campaign because he knows he was never going to deliver on them. When he was a minister for the Labour government, they produced a report saying, no, rent controls don't work. The London Assembly produced a report saying no, rent controls don't work. But what he knows is, if you're struggling to get housed, the words rent control sound great. If you're struggling to pay the rent at the end of the week, like many millions of Londoners do, because rent is crazy in London, I have a horrible personal experience of that, it sounds good, but it does not work. The way you deal with high rents in London is by supply. You must give the supply. So he has things like he won't build, he build on strategic industrial land, commonly known as brownfield sites. I will do a survey of them to see the ones we can build on to put even more land out there. We've got to supply people with places to actually be, not lock the people in who are lucky enough to have a place and then lock everybody else out, because that's another thing that rent controls do. If you doubt me, because you like the sound of rent controls, look what it's done in New York, what it's done in parts of Scandinavia, it's just devastating, particularly for young people. It just devastates the market for young people. So, so I, I wouldn't do that. Um, when you talk about Airbnb and those kind of people, they do need to be controlled because I just worry that they start to affect our housing supply. You know, if, if people are in a situation where they could add that flat to our general housing supply, but there's rules that stop that expense or just keep doing it, B and B style, um, Airbnb style, I would have to intervene in that because let me be very, very clear on this. The first, and for me, only people in contention for housing in London is Londoners. You've got to get Londoners housed first. 
so important. And I think sometimes too much Airbnb gets in the way of that. And there's also the idea that it, I went to, I went to an estate in Westminster where there's an awful lot of key safes everywhere. And you start to see that that high concentration of Airbnb flats was changing the makeup of that community. And I think that needs to be looked at as well. I'm not anti Airbnb as a business, let, let them thrive. We need people to come to London, but there needs to be a balance struck there. And I think that's one of the things that City Hall really could do because the City Hall, of course, looks London wide. Yeah, and, and uh, the um, uh, Nikki Aitken, um, Conservative MP in uh, two cities, I know, is putting in a, uh, a private member's bill about short, short. Um, so she's putting in a private member's bill about pedicabs um, and is, is working on, on on an Airbnb registration yeah. program. Um, yeah. What is your view on pedicabs now? We have inadvertently brought it up. I mean, to me, I think they're a bit of a pest, a bit of a nuisance. You see them whizzing all over the place. My, my only real relationship with them has been when tourists have been complained, have complained about being fleeced. And then when you look into it a bit deeper, you hear people talk about pedicab barons, people who control it. When you speak to the police, they worry about the safety, and, and the safety aspect of them, where you go to park them. So I think there's something need, significant needs to be done about them. So if you, if you were... View, Oh. Yeah, she's trying to get them brought in uh, into the um, licensed cab legislation. So they they then actually come under, I think, the, the mayor of London's um, uh, yeah. remit. But that way, you could you, you could a make sure that they're maintained and they're safe. You could make sure they actually do what they're doing. I, I uh, this was a few years ago now. But I saw a guy pedaling the wrong way up the road in a pedicab with people in the back. I remember mm -hmm. thinking, if I was in that little pedicab thing, I'd have a problem with that. But you know. <laughs> It is. Right, anyway, I've got, I got us off, uh, um, uh, off track into, uh, so I'm going to ask some of the questions that have been um, uh, uh, sent in. So Philip has uh, um, asked a question. Um, uh, he's, taken, he's taken advantage after Julian asked the second question. Philip's gone in as well. Um, uh, what do you think about the, the drug problem in London? Um, and what do you think of the UK's current drug policy? I think in London, we have a massive drug problem. It, it underlines a lot of our, our crime as well. I often speak to people who say to me, oh, we should legalize, we should legalize. I don't agree with that. I used to work for the biggest um, drug project in West London, the Blenheim Project. It's just there on Portobello Road at the top. It's, it's moved now. But what I learned from those years of working on that project is, there's a lot of people who low level use drugs who don't even see themselves as an addict don't realize the impact it's having on their lives and the people around them. So lots of petty crime, anything from stealing from their mum's purse just every now and then to the odd shoplifting or whatever, a little or checkbook and fraud and all the rest of that kind of stuff. I'm showing my age there by saying checkbooks. Um, I think all of that's a problem. And I think the idea that drug dealers are just going to disappear because you legalize is ridiculous because if we sell legal weed, it will effectively be meant for cigarettes. It will have all manner of um, legislation on top of it, and they'll be weak. Whereas your local drug dealer will get you the strongest weed possible. And when people smoke, they want to get high. So they'll compare the two and go and buy from him. It's as simple as that, or her. That's what will happen. So I worry about legalizing in, 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 that, in that sense. I think... If you look at drug use rates across London, they're actually going down. Young people don't use drugs as much as, say, my generation did. I think, it, I think that's a trend that will continue. Our current policy is not perfect, and there are people who just have small use, you know, and, and they're not criminals, they're not running around shooting or robbing or whatever. The police should, should focus far less on them and far more on the 39% increase we've had in robbery. So if your idea is that we would legalise to spare the police some work, there's other ways you could do that as well without having to, to legalise. But for me right now, I'd, I, I, would, I, would be, I would need to see an awful lot of evidence before I, I legalise. People tell me about studies in Canada and all the rest of that, but they don't tell you about um, the, legal, the trials that went on in Spain, that went wrong in, in Portugal and those kind of places. And of course, London is a very, very different city to any of the cities in Canada. Um, a question sent in from um, Guy. Um, what role do you see, um, and, and I don't know, Guy, Guy works in a, in a, in a library, uh, what role do you see London Library Services serving in the reopening of the, of the economy and reopening of, of London life? Um, there's two things I'd say. First, libraries in and of themselves are very useful. I think they, they hold, 
on a moral level, they hold on to the notion that knowledge is, 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 is sacred, is powerful, is important. And also, a modern library does much more than just house books. Um, I'm a massive music fan. And the reason I used to use a library on, on Labrador Grove there is because I had CDs. Once I figured that out, I was in there an awful lot. Um, but that's just one example of what libraries can do beyond that. Of course, they're great hubs for inf information. But I think a modern library service, um, in order to make itself um, invaluable, needs to do more and more of these innovative stuff. When you link the need to be innovative to what's going to happen after we come out of lockdown, I think that's the opportunity for libraries, isn't it? So if you look at the fact that people in, in, in local um, areas will be needing realistic, um, reliable, up-to-date information, I think libraries can do that, not only in their physical sense, but also in that online sense. I think every library should have a, as big an online footprint as possible. I think libraries are a valuable resource for schools. So the whole journey of, of home parenting, I'm sorry, of, of homeschooling has showed me <laughs> actually greater import from parents in young people's education means that young person will go further. That's something that libraries can do. They can generate local materials. They can run classes, not only for young people, but for parents. So parents can go on and then replicate that. It's those kind of things that are important because going forward, London will be slightly different. I don't think we'll go back entirely to business as usual. I think more of us will spend more time in our local area because many people will do much more work from home just because we understand how to do that now because it's a protracted period of lockdown. Yeah, they are, yeah, they are, they are an important resource for, for a lot of people. Um, I have a question from, um, from Mayor. I'm a, I'm a keen user of Boris bikes and I would, I would really like to see them extended beyond Marylebone and St John's Wood and down to Greenwich. There are no docking stations beyond those areas and fewer still in South East London. Is this something you'd be willing to campaign for? Let, let, let me give a more complete answer. So what I would say is this, South London has always been poorly served by transport. That's why the financial state of TfL under Card has been such a travesty. We lost the tram, the Sutton tram is gone, the Bakerloo line extension is gone, 18 projects we've lost because of the poor financial management. Many of those projects would have benefited South London, which is an awful shame. So that's why you need the Boris bikes. I would say this though, the Boris bikes are very expensive to run. I think a better way of doing it will be looking at these dockless bikes. Um, if we could do that in conjunction with um, local councils, we could find places where they are effectively a, a, a hub. You can go there so and know you're going to find a bike. And these a are like Lime and... and yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and all, and all those things. Because I think that's a much quicker way and you'll get much better coverage if you use those bikes. If you rely on the Bryce bike system, it, it's proven to be quite expensive and I don't think we'd, we'd get right down all across London. And I think Douglas Bikes is a quicker more affordable, more realistic way of doing that. Right, yeah, I think you're saying... So, you think... The other thing I'd say as well, with the money that um, we have in City Hall for um, super cycle super highways, there's been a huge underspend under this mayor. I, if I was in City Hall, I'd be looking at giving people access to cheap bike ownership. I would take some of that budget and give Londoners across London a discount when buying a bike, especially as our bike shops are an increasingly pres precious um, um, uh, asset that we don't want to lose, and it'd be a way of supporting people to get on bikes and supporting bike shops to continue to exist. Um, now we're getting quite, I know your time is precious, and uh, um, uh, we've got to the half hour, uh, half hour point, which is the, the time uh, I think initially allocated. Well, why don't you give me two or three questions at once, and then I can get a few done. Okay, done. Um, Okay, uh, from uh, um, uh, Leila, uh, um, uh, uh, who I think has, has sent some questions in before, but also just, just commented as well. Um, uh, she'd like to know what about more bike lanes? Um, and do you plan on reopening police stations shut by Khan? Um, uh, and, and what do you? What would Sean do differently than Sadiq to make Londoners feel safe going back to work once the lockdown is lifted, so that we can get our economy going again? Well, there you go. I'll just make a list. Here we go. <laughs> so bike lanes. I think the problem we've had with the current system is very, very poor consultation. There's been a lot of 
communities across London that think they've been railroaded. I think the key way to do it is to do it in consultation with councils and start with quiet ways and pedestrian-friendly neighbourhoods. I think that'll get people to understand the positive impact a bike lane could have and also demonstrate to locality if this bike lane is not going to work, we'll do something else. We won't just fo foist it on you. I think that's really, really important. So I, yes, the bike lanes, but more, more accurate, more inclusive um, consultation as well. So communities get the lane that they want, get the quiet ways that they want. That's the first thing. I am, when we talk about police stations, I'm on record, I ran a campaign, Sadiq Khan closed 38 counters to public access across London. I pledged to reopen all of them. The money is there. There's an underspending in the strategic investment fund. I'd redirect that money to open those, those stations. I think it's very important because I did a tour of most of those stations. I think I saw about 32 of them. Um, and they send a message of the police in retreat. Many of them kind of look derelict from outside. They're not because some of them are still used as police buildings, just no front counter. But it sends a real message to criminals that says, you know, the police are in retreat and it's your turn. And I want to reverse that message. That the culture around crime and, and how easy it appears is very important to criminals if we want to push down the crime all types of crime. And when it comes to going back to work, I think the first and most important thing we have to do is make it safe to travel. I've been calling for PPE for weeks now because many, many Londoners simply won't get on the system in the first place, which means it'll very be harder to get our, our economy going, which is vital to protect these jobs. So I'll be giving all of my staff PPE, if I was mayor, I'll be making sure they get regular health checks as well. I make sure the buses are getting a deep clean after every service. Same with the, with the tube as well. I would do that. And if someone says to me, where's the money for that? Remember, TIPA have £1.5 billion in reserves. Reserves are meant for emergency. I would argue a pandemic is an emergency. Um, I think that's, that's yeah, fair. Fair point. Um, do, happy for a few more? Should we, should we run? Yeah, let's try and get at least three or four in. Let's go, let's go. Okay, fine. Um, back onto, on to um, homelessness. Um, uh, we had a, sent, a question sent in before, and I think obviously considering your situation, um, your experience, um, how do you intend to solve the problem of homelessness on London streets? We've had a question um, put in the comments. Uh, many of the areas um, have seen increased amounts of littering, tipping and fouling. Uh, uh, to what end can the mayoralty serve to clean up the streets? Thank you. Uh, and um, uh, uh, from Mayor, I know there's been much talk about closing Oxford Street off for traffic. What's your view on this issue? Okay, let me, let me, let me start with litter because litter is a personal thing of mine. I, I, I am very, very annoyed at the amount of litter in London. If you live in a, in, a, in, a, in a supposedly bad neighborhood, one of the things you'll find is it is driven by the perception of the physical area and litter just brings the place down. So actually, I think litter really does need to be dealt with. If you live out in the outer reaches of London, you get a lot of very serious fly tipping, which has been a big issue as well. Again, it's just litter on, on, a, on a massive scale, so it needs to be dealt with. So the first thing I think we need to do is go back to that old fashioned notion we teach our children not to litter. It's as simple as that. Um, when I grew up in school, there was lots of anti-litter campaigns. I think those things are important. Secondly, where it's applicable for the mayor, I think litter bins are a useful thing. They've largely disappeared. There's some good reasons for that, but I think it's time to return them. Much of the litter in London, actually councils are responsible for. And I often wonder if we could help councils get much better service from whoever they have a contract with. Do councils um, enter into group agreements and get a really big contract and get really good service out of that? I, I hesitate to dictate to councils because, of course, they've been dealing with litter for years, but I do think we could, we could bring more emphasis to it because, of course, a clean London has two very important um, upswings for us all. One, it makes the place we live look and feel better and it increases our reputation internationally. If people come to London and think it's clean, they go back and tell that to people, and they're more likely to come here. How many of you have been abroad and have come back and said to people, oh, you know, Leipzig is really clean, or Paris is much cleaner than I, than I expected? That kind of stuff. That's why I think it's important. That, that's the first thing. If I go to Oxford Street, um, 
Oxford Street was a really bad example of the mayor picking a political fight he didn't need to have. Um, the local council, Westminster Council, responded to what it what its its um, residents were really worried about. All these huge buses going up there now, small narrow road that used to be on Oxford Street. That was just one of their major problems. Why the council, the residents, and then the council knocked it back. Um, there's two things I'd say. My plan to make all of the buses zero emission in London by the end of my first term would help that because those residents would then know that they're not going to be choking on fumes all the time. Also, I would have made sure I delivered Crossrail on time because there's a Crossrail station at the top there and it would increase the amount of people who could get there without having to drive, which means you could then close off um, off the street because it wouldn't have as big an impact on the, on the traffic. I know all the traffic impact studies were done, it would seem like it would be okay, but still, you always need to plan for these, for these things. And I think in partnership with the council and local residents, they could have got there. Because I think for um, Oxford Street's long-term well-being, it being pedestrianised it is vital. One thing I think I noticed, though, they didn't have very good cycle um, laying on there, which I think would be helpful. And also, they need access for black cabs to make sure that disabled people can get easy access to the street as well. But I think it should be pedestrianised, but it's got to be done in a way that the residents are comfortable with. And the, the, the last piece on homelessness, I, I think there's two things. Rough sleeping and homelessness are, are, are different. And I think when you talk about homelessness, that is about supply. It is about getting enough affordable um, accommodation in the London system as quickly as possible. So I talked earlier on about, you know, from sort of the middle downwards. So social housing right up to, you know, subsidised market rent and, and, and to buy as well. So people who are on a, on a normal wage, a normal salary can afford somewhere to live comfortably year on year on year. If people rent, they can have some kind of stability around that rent. That's why I was very happy when the government said they look at section 21 and all the rest of that. I remember when I came to rent where I live now and they, there's these spurious charges, admin charges, I utterly refused to pay them and then they went away. That demonstrated to me that the charges were never real. And I, and I wonder how many people across London have had to face that. And these are the kind of things that we're getting rid of now. But homelessness in the first instance is about supply. Secondly, we need to talk about people who are rough sleeping. We need to support people's mental health better. We need to support the third sector charities that deliver that work. As Mirror of London, when I would be building housing for people, I'd also be building accommodation for the charity source, such as St Mungo's, who provide you know, controlled sheltered accommodation for people with, with drug issues or drink issues or, or mental health issues, because to solve those issues isn't just about giving the people a home. A home's first approach is what we need, but also those people do need support. And I think the mayoralty can, can direct some more of its funds into that. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for answering all, the, all those questions. Now, we, we have wildly overrun. You've been very generous with your time. Uh, and, uh, I'll, I'll pick one more. Let's do one more. One more. Gosh, the, pre the, 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 the pressure is... Um, uh, is on. Um, okay, go on for, um, for Mayor on um, uh, cycling. Um, I believe we should do m much more to encourage people to cycle in and from work and perhaps introduce schemes that would benefit households financially if they opt to cycle to work. Uh, what do you think about campaigning for such schemes in London? I think you've already said you support the cycle route in Oxford also, Street. And, um, I'll say this. Let me add to this. That, that might be one of the happy um, unintended positive consequences from lockdown. Many, many cycling rates in the London are up. People are like, I don't want to get on that packed bus or train. I will cycle yeah. or walk. And I think that will help with the culture around it. You know, we got to the point where it was brave young men on, for us, pedal bikes, zooming to and fro on these cycles with the highways. What we need to do is get to the point where I feel it's safe to bring my young child on the bike on the road. And, you know, so people grow up with the idea that they can cycle. And, and locally as well, because London's huge. And is that going to so, be more, more superhighways? Listen, we can have superhighways as long as they work. But what I also think we really should be concentrating on is, like the questioner said, how do we financially incentivize people to, you know, own their own bike and use it? Because, of course, the psychological and health benefits are huge. So we should be doing something about that. That's why I said earlier, I think some of the cycling budget could be used for that. 
There's no point in having a big budget that you're not spending on things that people don't want. Give people what they need and what they want is what I'd say. So that's what I'd do with that as well. And to, excuse me, and to campaign on that, I believe I already am. I, I've, I've told people long and hard that we are going to have cycling in London. We do need to reduce the traffic in London. So there's more space for us to live in London. And getting people on their bikes where possible, where applicable, where desirable is something I'm absolutely up for. Definitely, definitely. We need a London that can move and cycling is part of moving. I'd also add to that as well, walking. We need to elevate the, 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 the sort of status of walking. With more and more people living locally, staying where they are, walking needs to be made safe and pleasant as well so that people can walk to and fro. Thank you. I think that's that's been enormous. That's been so informative and so interesting. Um, I know you've got through a lot of questions, a lot of different topics and areas, uh, and it's uh, actually I think it's really shown the depth of your thoughts and thinking into all the different aspects of London. You know, it's quite clear you were ready to be be elected mayor uh, had that election happened, and now you've obviously got another another year to. To, to refine that and get the message across so that more people uh, um, you know, see how good how good you are and uh, and, and uh, um, put the well, well vote vote for you when that happens. Um, but in the meantime, you're obviously doing important work in focusing on getting London safer during this pandemic and and pushing for uh, for safer transport and and, and uh, other issues. So thank you very much for that too. My pleasure. Let, let me just finish by saying this. If you're watching this feed and you're not a conservative, people will try to stop you looking our way by talking about our values and nasty party and all the rest of that. I challenge you to get involved with us. Challenge me, send me questions, ask your local association why they're doing what they're doing. Because the London Conservative Party that I that I joined, that I recognise, is very connected to its local area. We're the wardens at church. We work in a local um, play group. We volunteer for the community centre. We are the doers. That's how I see us. We are we are a compassionate bunch who like to come up with with you know realistic answers to the challenges that it is to live in London. So before people tell you we don't share your values, look around, find a conservative and speak to them. What you find is we probably do. And you'll find that people are trying to manipulate you by saying, you know, we're sexist, we're racist, we're this, that and the other. Trying to make you think of yourself in only one way. If someone does that to you, you know they're trying to manipulate you. Why don't you just join in a conversation with us? I happen to be in a privileged position to be leading some of that conversation. And I guarantee you, I look forward to having it with you. We can't always agree, but we can always get along. And I'll always give people a hearing because I don't believe anybody has a monopoly on common sense. And my politics is what I'd like to believe is common sense for people who have to work for a living. For me, that signifies about 90% of people in London. London is a town of hustlers. I like to hustle. Come and have the conversation with me and we'll see what we can resolve. Fantastic. Well, look, and talking of getting involved, obviously I'm chairperson of Westminster North Conservatives, uh, and uh, if anyone's in the, in in the sort of, in that part of uh, town, then do we'd love to get you. We'd love to hear you and love you to be involved. Um, thank you again, thank you. Thank I've, you for me. I've enjoyed it. I think it's been really interesting and informative. So thank you, thank you very much indeed. Uh, and uh, I think this is where we sign off. So thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye, 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 bye Sean. Thank you. Um, and thank you again, everyone, for, for joining us. And as, as I said, yeah, I'm chairperson of Westminster North Conservatives. We're very keen to get more people involved. Uh, we're a nice community of people focused on uh, uh, making uh, our patch and obviously the whole of London better with, with Sean. Uh, so uh, if you want to get involved, uh, you can hit our, our website uh, and all our contacts are there. Um, thank you for watching. Thank you for getting involved. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully uh, we'll be doing more live interviews and we'd love to have you join then as well. So thank you again. Uh, goodbye.